The Old Testament reading for the 15th Sunday after Trinity is from 1 Kings chapter 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to drink it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. The epistle is from Galatians chapters 5 and 6. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. The Lord to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. 
They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, I, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the gospel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Early last year, the Irrelevant Investor published an article titled, Just a Little Bit More and told of the NBA player Chris Bosch, who had recently been on a podcast talking about how unhappy he was. The author wrote this. It's hard to imagine how a 23-year-old who signs a five-year, $127 million deal could be anything other than giddy all the time. This type of thing is possible because the 23-year-old was once a 19-year-old who signed a four-year, $23 million deal. $127 million is a ridiculous amount of money, but so is $23 million. What can you do with $25 million a year that you're not already doing with $5 million? The second contract didn't change his life. It just took him from richer to richer, which doesn't move the happiness needle. Ironic that today there's a movement occurring in our society that looks down on some people who are rich, as though they're hoarding the wealth from the rest of us. And there's a bizarre phrase that you see on protest signs or heard chanted saying, eat the rich. Well, is it really a dislike of rich people or is it envy? Given the state of mankind that is in a perpetual struggle against sin that dwells in our members, it sounds a lot more like envy or greed than it does equality. It's not okay when somebody else has it all, but it's okay when I have it all. There's a legend about John D. Rockefeller and this legend says that he was asked once by a reporter, Mr. Rockefeller, how much is enough? And he responded, just a little bit more. How much is enough? Is $127 million enough? It didn't make Chris Bosch any, any happier. How much is enough? Money and material wealth make a very poor idol. The wealth of the world is a God that is always demanding our attention. It's always demanding sacrifice. Because the more you have, the more you worry about it. The more you have, the more you need to work at securing it from those who would take it from you. And the more you have, the more you want to add to it, just a little bit more. This idol is always demanding more and more and more from you. 
Jesus knows the tendency of our flesh and the demands of those weak idols of wealth. And so he tells us, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. On the one hand, the one master makes demands of you constantly and requires that you sacrifice for it. And don't forget, Uncle Sam wants his cut too. But the other master, the other master sacrifices for you. The other master serves you, giving you all that you need to support this body in life, giving you all that is required for your eternal salvation, and it's tax-free. Just think about it for a minute. The more you have, the more you're concerned about security. The more that you have, the more you're concerned about safety to protect it. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with worldly wealth, it is, as I said, a poor idol. Because it doesn't bring happiness and contentment. Jesus says in chapter 19 of St. Matthew's Gospel, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So be on guard against the fear, love, and trust of material wealth. For it is a master that quickly and easily becomes an idol. An idol that can even make you think pious thoughts towards the true God. That you must have done something right and that's why God is blessing you in this way. Think about this too in light of what Jesus says in Matthew 19. We live in the most prosperous and wealthy nation in the history of the world. Is it any wonder why Christianity is on a downward trend? Which master have people hitched their wagon to? And is anybody more happy? Is anybody more content than before? Or have the riches of the world and our own envy and our own greed just made things worse? In the movie Beckett, made in the 1960s, Right before Thomas Becket is consecrated as the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1162, he was required to take a vow of poverty and give away all of his earthly possessions. And in the movie starring Peter O'Toole, Becket says that this is the happiest day of his life. He thought he would be sad because he had to give away all of his earthly possessions. But he was actually joyful about it. None of us are like Chris Bosch. None of us have a five-year, $127 million contract. None of us are like Elon Musk and can afford to send a rocket up into space. Yet even these, in their splendor and glory, is not arrayed like the lilies of the field. Jesus says, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? God knows what you need, and he provides it for you. He does that work through his creation. He gives rain and sunshine in their season. 
And as we learn from the great late Paul Harvey, on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. By the hands of farmers, truckers, butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, God provides for you. And he gives you the work you do to earn so that you can support your family and your neighbors and so that you can support the ongoing work of Christ's church on earth to proclaim the gospel to all peoples and extend his kingdom. For you, the baptized Christian, earthly wealth has a new meaning and a new mission. Because for you, you have been made to realize where your worldly wealth comes and who the giver of all these things is. Jesus says your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Seek God's kingdom. Seek his reign. Seek his rule. In other words, what Jesus teaches in the second petition, thy kingdom come. That his word and spirit would come to you. That where the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, there the Holy Spirit would lead you to believe it. The kingdom of God is here for you now in the divine service. For here it is that you hear the word of God and by faith you receive it and receive the forgiveness of all your sins and life everlasting. Here is where the body and blood of Jesus is given to you and God's name is placed on you as it was first placed on you in your baptism, so it is again placed on you in benediction as you are sent back into the world to work and to serve. So, where, so what is the place of wealth and money in this Christian life? It's in service to one another. It's in sacrifice for each other. You have countless opportunities to give to charities, to churches, to missions, to works of mercy, both secular and religious. The one closest to you is the offering plate. Because that is the nearest work of God of his kingdom for you. It is not God, though, who needs your wealth, who needs your offering. The church on earth does. The lights, the air conditioning, the heat, insurance, maintenance, cleaning, phones, internet, it all costs earthly riches. And what is the biggest line item on most church budgets? Most often, it's the pastor. But why? So you can have him fully devoted to the study of God's word and prayer so that he is better able to serve you and teach you and lead you in the ways of God and his word, sometimes with rebuke and correction, but always with patience and love. But the church doesn't demand a tax. We don't have the ushers bar the door and you can't leave until the budget is met. 
you are free to give of what God has freely given to you. The Bible does not demand of you a tithe or 10%, but that is a good example for us of first fruits giving. But you give not because God demands it. You give not because I'm just a greedy person who wants a salary. But you give as God in Christ has freely given you all things. So who is your master? Is it money? Or is it God? Which one makes demands on you? Money or God? Your Heavenly Father is the one who gives you freely. First, His only begotten Son for, to pay the price for your redemption and also all that you need to support this body and life. So Gary, bar the doors. No. God doesn't need your money. You need his mercy. You need his forgiveness. You need his salvation. And it's yours. It's yours for the sake of Jesus. For he willingly obeyed his Father's will and laid down his life to save you. It's free. And it's yours by faith alone. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.